and then admit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, here you can tell me when to move to the next slide. Yeah, sure, sure. Yes. Yeah. And welcome to the EPRI Journals webinar. And uh, let's wait for uh, two minutes to let everyone join in the meeting room, and uh, and then we can start. Welcome everyone, and uh, we just wait for one minute and uh, to let everyone join the meeting room. So be patient. Okay, and uh, welcome everyone. And my name is E, and I'm the social media editor of the Elsewhere E Prime Journal. And uh, Emily, and uh, a publisher of Elsewhere, you probably cannot see her, but uh, she's also with us today. And uh, today, our webinar speaker, Professor Mayan Popov, and uh, he is also our co editor in chief uh, of the E Prime Journal. And he will present a very interesting topic. Uh, on the power system protection, has titled it Some Essentials Concerning uh, Synchrophaser Based Protection Schemes and uh, Component Protection. Professor Popo, and uh, please go to the next page, and uh, I'm very happy to introduce you. And uh, Professor Marian Popo is a full professor at TU Delft, and uh, his major fields of interest are the future power systems large scale power system trading and intelligent protection and wide area monitoring. And he's the member of the SIGRI and actively participating in the two working groups. In 2010, he received the prestigious Dutch uh, Hedinam Prize for his extraordinary research achievements. And uh, he received the, the IEEE PES prize paper award and the IEEE Switchgear Committee Award in uh, 2011. And he is now associate editor for the Elsewhere's International Journal of Electrical Power and Energy Systems, and a co editor in chief of Elsewhere's E Prize. And in 2017, he founded the Dutch Power System Protection Center to promote research and education in power system protection. And he is also an IEEE fellow. And before we begin, a quick reminder. And uh, due to the nature of our webinar, and uh, we have muted everyone's microphone. So, uh, but please feel free to uh, provide your questions with us uh, via the QA button or via the, the chat, and we will address them at the end. So, now the stage is yours, Professor Mayan Popov. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Zhang, for. Uh, uh your words and welcome everyone to this protection to for to this presentation as uh, i was announced my name is marian popov i work at delft university of technology uh, before i go to the topic a few words about uh, my employer tu delft is located in the southwestern part of the netherlands in the province of south holland and uh, as you all maybe know the Netherlands in a few pictures. It's the country of excellent infrastructure, lots of windmills and monuments, the country of tulips and famous artists, and of course the country of sports. Theo Delft is also very proud of his students and alumni who were Olympic athletes and winners. 
Delft University of Technology is founded in 1842 by the King William II of the Netherlands. It started as a Royal Academy for the education of civil engineers and currently is a very large university. Some numbers from last year concerning education and research. Student population, over 26,000 students. The number of obtained bachelor and master degree over 7,000 and the university has offers also 16 bachelor programs and 33 master programs. Concerning research, the number of PhD students last year was 3,314 and the obtained PhD degrees was 408. The number of uh, publications, scientific publications that were published last year was 4,433 and everything related to the publications from TU Delft you can find on this website pure.tudelft.nl. I will start now my presentation. Uh, firstly, I'll say a few words about the protection classification. Protection can be classified according to the types and duration of disturbances. A general classification is based on electromagnetic and electromechanical transients. It is known the first are faster and the second are slower. Hence, power system relaying belongs more to electromagnetic transients and wide area monitoring and protection is used mostly where electromechanical oscillations occurs. Some of these uh, events can be seen, uh, topics can be seen also in the slide depending on the duration of the time. And uh, protective relaying is being normally for component protection. In the future, it will be used a lot for HVDC protection then we have lightning protection which is not related to protective relaying however it belongs to uh, the type the, the part of protection and wide area monitoring and protection is uh, a rather new technology and promising technology it provides faster measurements and in the future power systems fast disturbances will occur and faster measurements than those provided by SCADA will be needed Normally, if we rely on a SCADA, in that case, we can say that uh, the disturbances, or actually the data from SCADA are provided every two or four seconds. However, in the future power systems, we will have farther, uh, faster, faster phenomena, which actually, if we don't measure faster, we can miss some of the disturbances if we use if we don't use these data which are coming from the synchro phasers. Wide area monitoring protection is realized by normally by synchro phasers. We call them also phasor measurement units and they are being used uh, in a way that are synchronized with uh, GPS. They provide real time measurement of measurement values of voltage and current phasors, frequency and the rate of change of frequency, which are transferred to normally to the desktop computer where the algorithms operate. I'm going to present uh, one application in this case, uh, out of step protection, so out of step protection or loss of synchronism. It is a condition when a generator experienced large angular differences from the other generators or the system, or there are large angle differences between neighboring utilities connected by tie lines, for instance. Concerning uh, the application of synchro phasers, I provide here one illustration. So PMUs are normally installed in substations. They measure voltage and current phasers. They supply these voltage and current measures, uh, measurements uh, through phasor data concentrator, in this case to a phasor controller. And on the phasor controller, there are algorithms that run and are capable of detecting particular system anomalies. In this way, 
upon the occurrence of such anomalies, responsible circuit breakers can be switched off. How this has been uh, um, accomplished for an actual project in this research paper, which is out of step protection based on discrete uh, angle derivatives published in IEEE Access recently, two years ago. Uh, such an application has been developed based on the provided measured system data. The out of step protection algorithm has been installed in on a general electric phaser controller. Of course, this phaser controller runs with a different syntax. And in this case, we had the support of the company to somehow adjust what we have developed to adjust on this controller. Uh, the system has been simulated in RTDS environment. And normally we use the virtual synchro phasers by making use of the GT net card to transfer data from synchro phasers data according to the IEEE standard 3780 to the phaser controller. And upon occurrence of particular disturbance, whenever the protection was supposed to operate, the tripping command was sent back to RTDS by using the goose messaging. What we can also see here is uh, also another system. So we have simultaneously compared this new algorithm by the existing ones, which are installed on commercial relays. We used General Electric and Siemens relays. And we provide comparison of uh, the results based on a different uh, system contingency. More of this work can be found in this paper. So here I'm going to present just how the algorithm operates and uh, I will also address two cases. So the out of step protection concept, it's simply realized by making use of the power angle curve. The operating conditions for the out of step uh, protection are uh, angular, angular speed and uh, angular acceleration uh, is positive for two and three consecutive measurements. However, these conditions may be not, may be not fulfilled during, may be also fulfilled during normal conditions. So which means that these are important. However, they are not sufficient. Therefore, blocking and restraining criteria needs to be implemented depending on depending on the circumstances. Here I'm going to explain why the protection should be blocked or restrained. So the protection will be blocked whenever the voltage is above 0.89 per unit, which means that normally in the electrical power systems, the voltage may drop for 10%, which means that if the voltage is above 89 per, uh, percent in that case uh, the protection must be blocked this is not an out of step condition the protection will also be blocked when the voltage drops below 20 percent 0.2 per unit this indicates a faulty situation or the line bus bar is not energized well if it's a faulty situation then the out of step protection also must be blocked because it is not the goal of the protection to eliminate faults. Uh, there is another protection solution which is used to eliminate faults, of course. The protection also uh, makes use of restraining criteria. So these restraining criteria are also two. The derivative of the power is positive and the derivative of the voltage is also positive for two consecutive measurements. The first criteria indicates that the operating point is on the first half of the power angle curve. And the second criteria indicates that the system leaves the swinging condition. So actually stabilizes and the voltage increases. This is a flow chart of the algorithm which can be seen that consists of three major parts. The first is the blocking. 
the second is the restraining criteria and the third is detecting logic and operation which means that normally we have to pass through all these three in order to operate and uh, we have uh, tested uh, this algorithm on on many different uh, cases that i'm going to explain now here before we were sure that uh, this algorithm really is reliable the out of step protection concept has been tested firstly on modified IEEE 39 bus network for two crucial cases. The first is interruption of a fault on a tie line that we see here, that is case A. And the second is a part where we have uh, put a lot of uh, wind power generation, which is connected to a type 4 converter and this case demonstrate the isolated generator that goes out of step. So in the scope of this presentation, I will just uh, refer to two cases, one stable and one unstable case, which, uh, which have been uh, done for a case A when the fault occurs on the tie line. So when a fault occurs on a tie line, and uh, is eliminated for several cycles so that we do not exceed the critical clearing angle, then we have a stable case. So this is actually what can be seen here. So what we see on this in this network here is uh, the we have first a normal operation. So during normal operation, the auto step protection is blocked, but also at the same time it is restrained. Instant one denotes that the fault current occurs. Protection is still blocked because it's not an auto step condition. It's a fault current. At the same time, the protection is also restrained, right? Instant two denotes that uh, the fault is removed. Well, actually, the fault is previously removed. However, at instant two, the conditions are fulfilled so that the protection is deblocked. However, it is still kept restrained. Until it is kept restrained, it will not operate. The protection is uh, uh, blocked until instant three where we actually see here that the voltage is recovered. It exceeds about one per unit, and then the protection is deblocked. However, at the same time, we have a stable case, and that is why the protection is kept to be restrained. So there is no operation because we have a stable power swing. In the second case, we used the same contingency. The fault lasts for longer period of time so that the critical clearing angle is exceeded and unstable uh, operation in the power system takes place followed by power swinging so in this case we see that up to uh, time instant three seems everything the same however the protection remains here unblocked until we see that the conditions for the restraining are also for, for waiving the restraining are also fulfilled and uh, uh, the restraint here drops to zero which provides activation which provides the protection to be allowed to operate right so we see the blocking and restraining they do not exist any longer protection may operate and the condition for the protection to operate are fulfilled because the algorithm detects that this is an unstable power swing. Conclusion of this is that adaptive settingless protection concept uh, is uh, found to be very powerful. It has been already implemented in practice. And this was a scientific project that was supported also by General Electric and system operator in the Netherlands Tenet. However, we could not implement this in the Netherlands because in the Netherlands we have short lines and normally this out of step condition practically does not exist. However, it was implemented in Iceland 
where actually we have an island and uh, normally when we have uh, splitting in the power system then it is expected that the voltage may oscillate finally this has been compared with the existing solution and uh, we know that the existing solution normally use the impedance based trajectory uh, concept which is very different than this one the advantage is that uh, what we found that this is faster, but also is settingless. So we don't have to provide any kind of uh, settings except those in which the algorithm operates. I'm going to move now to the next topic, which is uh, synchrophaser based state estimation and anomaly detection and classification. Nearly 10 years ago, in the scope of uh, uh, NVO, that's a Dutch Scientific Council project. We developed a platform that had it was an RTDS platform that has been used to investigate the control islanding in the power systems. By making use of uh, this platform, it was possible to determine the coherency of the generators. So in this presentation, that was not the topic more on that can be found in this paper however we used a similar platform to adapt for state estimation and to consider anomaly detection discrimination and identification so the state estimator that is developed is a co-simulation platform by using computer a that we see here the system is simulated in rscat environment Time sampled data are exported to computer B through this phaser data concentrator. And uh, these data are used to uh, run the state estimator that was developed in MATLAB. The performance are tested on quasi steady state, sudden load change, and bad data. And for both, we made a comparison between enhanced Kalman filtering state estimator and unscented Kalman filtering. So both operate successfully. However, we found that the enhanced Kalman filtering was faster. And these results, more about this can be found in this paper that has been published in 2022 in, in International Journal of Electric Power and Energy Systems. In the scope of this project, uh, also a very important part is dynamic incremental learning for real-time disturbance event classifications. So we know nowadays that a lot is being invested in machine learning algorithms. Many of those machine learning algorithms work also offline. So we collect the data, but th then we train the, the, the algorithm by using offline data. However, in the future, we can uh, not rely on offline data training because normally the disturbances that will occur in the electrical power systems will be faster. Normally, it is not only important to detect faults. Once we detect a fault, then protection will operate and will detect these faults maybe. However, we need to detect the sick operation of the power system. This could be, for instance, a lot of harmonics that comes due, due to interaction of different components, or it could be aging of the equipment that may cause arcing, or it could be something else, lightning, for instance, or other disturbances that still are not so critical immediately to cause failure of the power system. However, they will accelerate the system aging or cause suddenly system failure. Well, in the scope of uh, this work, dynamic incremental learning for real-time disturbances, this disturbance event classification, we developed a dynamic incremental learning method and we compared this one with the traditional ways. So we see that the performance of this is quite successful. And finally, I come to the uh, main slide of this part and that is AI supported methods for situational awareness where we use synchrophaser data. So 
normally the synchrophaser data. As we could see, we have used to develop a state est estimator with a bad data detector, then real-time disturbance detection algorithm, and finally there could be also other algorithms like, for instance, dynamic line or cable rating. So normally, in this case, we can determine the cable opacity or whether or not how much we reserve we have to load the cable, which is very important to see whether or not we will uh, run risk of congestion, congestion in the network. These other applications can be also a supplement to the state estimator as well that determines the system state. I will now move on shortly to a next important topic, which is protection against IBR, inverter-based renewable fault currents. Whilst in the classical systems, we have a synchronous generator in which the fault current shape is uh, quite determined. We have large amplitudes that last for a longer period of time where we have uh, Subtransient, transient, and steady state component. In the future, IBR based generator faults will be quite different. They will have not so high amplitudes and they will be damped much faster. This raises quite some challenges for the protection, especially how the protection will detect the faults and how we can remove these faults. So the solution can be found in developing new numerical relaying algorithms and control strategies to enhance the protection operation. For the first, I will say something uh, about at the end of the presentation, where I will talk about cross-country faults. And for the second, I will just refer to one application that we have uh, that uh, we have done together with the Albrook University. For instance, sometimes we can provide different control strategies that will improve the sensitivity of the protection. This has been done in this work published uh, last year. So upon the occurrence of a fault on a transmission line, which is protected by a directional protection, a suitable control strategy provides current limitation and and impedance phase angles for the positive and the negative to be min 90 degrees. So this denotes forward zone. Normally we know that the directionality should be between zero and min 180 degrees. So normally min 90 degrees to have a sensitive protection. And this has been done exactly in this work by modifying the control strategy to provide these angles uh, to be exactly min 90 degrees. So more about this work can be found in this paper here. There are, of course, limitations here, but also there are things that should be addressed in the future. I will now refer to uh, another topic, which is uh, resonances by considering the effect of the ground. So resonance effects have not been sufficiently investigated so far. Most research so far has been conducted in lab environment where everything is grounded almost ideally. However, the complexity is even larger if we take into account the grounding effects. So a good grounding for 50 Hertz may be a very bad grounding for higher frequencies as the grounding impedance is far from zero and may show unpredictable effects that depend also on the soil structure. It is also very much dependent on where these transformer neutral points are grounded. So it is not the same if it is grounded like this or it is grounded differently here. So we have a lot of if-then questions concerning this matter. However, once we uh, start thinking on developing uh, protection methods against these resonances, we must be very sure that everything that we simulate, we simulate correctly. 
all the components in this case must be modeled in a broad frequency range depending on the phenomena so normally lightning phenomena are one of the fastest that may have up to one or above one megahertz depending on the rate of rise of the lightning current and uh, also all other components needs to be uh, very accurately modeled well this kind of work has been conducted uh, yeah nearly 10 years ago so i will refer the readers to this paper investigation of the over voltage and fast transient phenomena on transformer terminals by taking into account the grounding effects this has been published in uh, IEEE transactions on industry applications where we accurately modeled the overhead lines, the grounding system, the transformer and the surge arrestor. The next will be to develop protection of transformers, uh, develop devices to protect the transformers against fast transients and resonance over voltages. And this is a part of an uh, ongoing project so the recent work on this has been published this month as you could see in IEEE transactions on circuits and systems we developed a modular series transient suppressor so this is a device which is in series connected to the cable right and uh, a, Quite some uh, numerical analysis and simulations have been uh, conducted in order to find out how to adjust these parameters to be capable of suppressing particular transients with resonance frequencies. So uh, I will just uh, show a few results on this. And again, I will refer the reader to read this paper. This work is still ongoing and we are still making uh, ideas to perform field measurements on this and to see how this will operate in practice. This is the uh, how the frequency sweep test was conducted in the high voltage lab at TU Delft. This is the prototype of the device. And this is our high voltage lab where we tested this device by applying lightning impulse. The results, this, what we see in this graph here, the blue line shows the lightning impulse. The black line shows the voltage at the transformer terminals. And between the source and the transformer, it is the uh, MC, uh, the device, the voltage drop on the device. What we see above here is the harmonic, are the harmonic impedances of each of the modules. In total, we have four. So each of the module, we recorded the harmonic impedances. And uh, the black line shows the sum of these impedances, just an algebraic sum of these impedances. However, the brown line shows the measured impedance. So what we see here that for this resonance frequency, which is slightly above 100 kilohertz, the impedance in increases quite a lot during transient, which is stressed with this uh, frequency. So we provide some natural operation or natural increase of the impedance in case of having a fast transients which could be with this resonance frequency that will that will help us to protect the transformer of course this is a device to suppress trans, uh, to suppress uh, resonance frequencies however normally we still have to keep the surge arrestor as a device to limit the amplitude of the over voltages. There are some, of course, there are quite some advantages of this uh, device, and all this has been uh, reported uh, in, 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 in the paper with uh, more measurements, with a lot of measurements, and you can find a lot of data there. Finally, I will refer to uh the topic of cross-country faults and distance protection 
So this is also a very new paper. It has been, it has just been published in our journal, uh, E Prime: Advances in Electrical Engineering, Electronics, and Energy: Real-Time Simulation of Distance Protection for Cross-Country Faults. Those who work with uh, power system protection are aware that cross-country faults are one of the most challenging uh, contingencies for the overcurrent and distance protection. Cross-country faults may cause unnecessary protection operation during simultaneous fault occurrence. For instance, when we have on one line or on different lines, we have at the same time different or the same type of faults and uh, protection can maloperate or may not operate. Uh, in this paper, we propose a recursive discrete Stockwell transform method to address these challenges. For this purpose, we needed to develop a distance protection model in RTDS environment, and uh, the applied method has been tested for approximately 450 different cross-country faults in order to find out that the concept that we develop is uh, operates correctly. In order to understand this uh, paper more, I will also refer the readers to the previous paper that we published related to the topic of distance protection. This has been published in the International Journal of Electric Power and Energy Systems in 2021. And uh, this work, this paper summarizes four year of research work that we have conducted in the scope of the European project Migrate from 216, from 2016 to 2020. In uh, this work, uh, two universities and uh, 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 several utilities were involved, particularly Delft University of Technology, University of Manchester, United Kingdom at that time, and also Red Electrica España. That was the Spanish system operator. Uh, after performing a lot of uh, cases, uh, simulations with hardware in the loop simulation, with uh, commercial relays, we found out that by having uh, converter-based faults, IBR faults that I have mentioned previously, uh, protection mostly experienced difficulties in case of uh, ungrounded faults, two-phase faults and three-phase faults, ungrounded faults. Of course, we tested different types of protection, different types of relays. If you search in the publications that we published, there are quite some uh, other uh, results published here. However, the major difficulty in the operation of the protection was actually related to the fault detection. We found that actually uh, impedance uh, algorithm, uh, in, well, normally the, the impedance enters in the protection zone of the relay, but the relay does not operate. Therefore, we focused ourselves on developing a fault detector in this case. And for this purpose, we found that uh, applying of the S-transform could be suitable. Maybe there will be other solutions. We work also on some other solutions at this moment, but at that time we decided to use this S-transform. And it was also important that we develop uh, the full digital uh, distance protection relay so that we test all these methods because it was very important to uh, have a reliable uh, distance protection relay. So the relay consists of a fault detection, faulty phase selection, then directionality, and impedance, which was important to determine the zones, whether it operates in zone one, zone two, or zone three. So I would not refer in this presentation on how the relay was developed. It's uh, published in this paper, so it's open access published and can be read. 
the faulty phase selector logic that has been uh, applied in this paper is uh, this, and this is how the determination of the faulty phase is uh, achieved by making use of the Stockwell energy for the fault current in each phase. I will now refer to the case study and I will wrap up my presentation. Uh, we studied uh, this kind of system. We have a double effect induction generator that supplies, it's connected to the grid through two parallel lines. The relay protection is in this, in the, in the upper line on the right hand side. And uh, we studied uh, quite some cases. So the infit power of the generator was changed. Uh, uh, we used two infit powers, so 40 and 200 megawatt. They deliver wind uh, energy, but also there were cases where we studied a synchronous generator. Then uh, fault distances of 10%, 75% and 90% in line one, that is this line, which means that this protection must operate with the first zone. Uh, and a fixed fault distance, which is in the middle of the line, two in this line. That is actually what we see here is IB46. The fault types were five per line, which means that we have uh, two phase to ground, two phase to ground, two phase to ground, taking into account between all phases. And then we have a phase to ground with uh, in one phase with uh, BC in the other phases, and also for the other for, for the other line the same. So if we take that we have two cases here, three cases here, okay, this is one, and we have five and five, then we have two times three, that's six, times five, it's uh, 30, and times five is 150. For each simulation, we each simulation we repeated three times. So in total, we performed for this case with infinite generation 450 real-time simulations. This is uh, the case. So I will just demonstrate one case here: a single phase to ground fault occurs in line one, and a phase to phase fault AB in line two occurred at the same instant. So these fault is removed by the distance protection here you see after two cycles as the fault is removed the other fault is removed by itself normally we need to remove it ourselves because we don't have a relay however what is important to see here is that relay operates on a fault that is single phase to ground fault in its zone However, it does not operate on the other zone. So we see here also that the faulty phase selected correctly uh, determine the faulty phase. Well, more about this and about all this case study can be read in the paper. It is uh, also uh, open access published in E Prime. And of course, if you have any other questions, you can always contact me. The main conclusions for this work is that uh, the main reason for using the Stockwell energy as a fault detector is its high sensitivity to distortion produced during fault currents. And the proposed method can detect ground faults during cross country faults with a half cycle following the fault onset. Well, that was my presentation. I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, of course, now if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer. Thank you very much. Uh, I very enjoy your speech, and uh, and uh, for the every participant, and we are very encourage you to leave your question in our QA and chat, and we are very happy to uh, bring your question in our discussion. Uh, so the first question is that uh, are the existing protection algorithms also applicable to large-scale inverter-based networks, especially for the low SCR situation? 
Yes, uh, short circuit ratio plays an important role, and especially where I mentioned the direction here, the short circuit ratio is very important in this case. So we didn't focus in this work on the short circuit ratio, we short on specific cases where we had also developing on the algorithm. However, of course, this is a, this is a common practice to pay attention to SCR in this case, and uh, normally uh, the ratio between between the source impedance and the line impedance plays an important role, especially for directionality. Yeah. Thank you. We have a paper on this, I guess, together with. Uh, uh, let me let let me just remember. It was uh, also about uh, eight years ago, um, with uh, Dr. Azizi, who was also involved in this uh, migrate uh, project uh, with me. I think we had a paper on this where also short circuit ratio. It was in IEEE transactions published. Yeah. Yeah, probably this participant can reach out to you and that you request the, the, the paper. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. The next question is from the EFA and uh, as inverters are becoming more integrated into the power systems, have there been any real world cases of relay more functions related to their prudence? Uh, if, if there is, uh, could you please repeat last? Uh, uh, have there been any real world cases of relay mode functions related to their prudence? Okay, well, uh, especially we, uh, <laughs> the migrate project was uh, the goal of the migrate project, especially the operation of protection was uh, heavily related to the fact that we will have, we will experience difficulties with ungrounded faults. And uh, our work, so we worked nearly one year on testing the classical protection. Uh, we used this with a developed model, which was uh, uh, grid following converter, but it doesn't matter for the protection a lot if it's grid following or grid forming converter and the protection. So normally these are faults, they operate in a very short period of time. However, the problem that we found in this was exactly what I have presented here. The form, the envelope of the fault current in this case is very different than that one resulting from synchronous generators. And in this case, if you have type 4 converter, then you have a prompt rise of the fault current, which later is removed and practically the relay does not have time to detect the fault. My experience is that we decreased the fault detection to the minimum. At one point for some relays, I cannot say which one because this project is protected until 2025, but with some relays we experienced uh, that the, uh, the fault will be detected, However, uh, normally users would do not want to, utilities do not want to decrease this fault operation, this uh, tripping current to a very low value because it may sometimes cause problems if you have overload and normally it affects also the sensitivity of the CTs and all these things. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, some question probably from my side for the for detection of the power system, I'm very interesting. Does it suffer any uncertainties? For example, you have PMU or controller detected some errors, but the power system doesn't have any uh, error. Uh, in fact, uh, are there any of this kind of uncertainties in the power system for detection? Uh, particular for which fault detection? Yeah, uh, uh, anything. Yeah, yeah. It, it, uh, I just uh, uh, curious about. Power system is a very important asset, and if we have a lot of uncertainties, mm -hmm. we just rely on some controller to tell us uh, it has some faults, but probably there are a lot of uh, actual faults uh, in reality. Uh, there will be cost a lot of cost uh, yeah, for the well, system. Well, the, the fault, faults resulting from um, faults resulting from uh, let's say from the converters, they are they are limited. So the fault current is limited, right? 
Yeah. However, they may cause different problems if they are not removed promptly. Of course, mm -hmm. they're low. You don't have to maybe disconnect them immediately. However, if you have low currents, but you have fault, this may cause problem for the voltages in the network. If uh, we deal with normally with the power systems, when we talk about wide area monitoring, we have to distinguish between wide area monitoring and protective relaying. Right? These are used to disconnect currents, so to eliminate currents. The others are more, these are system integrity protection schemes. So they operate normally on the system level to prevent the cascade failure of the electrical power systems. And their wide area monitoring will be quite important for the future because the opinion now as we move to smart grids is that in the future maybe these state estimators we will not need it if we have uh, if we have synchrophaser in every substation the system is fully observable then you don't need them because you measure all these things so the state estimators were developed a long time ago because we do not have fully all measurements to be provided in the power system so that is why there was a Nonlinear methods applied where you can use some measurements, but also some pseudo measurements, and then you use a lot of iterations of uh, over determined system to determine the state. In the future, this maybe will disappear. We will have a lot of synchrophasers. However, the question will be what we will do with all those data and how we're going to use this data. This is an uh, important thing. Uh, then a lot of challenges is also with the control. So how we can use this control, but to improve the operation of the power system. And that is what we did also with Alborg uh, um, last year. Of course, this is a work that uh, still have to be continued. Yes, as you mentioned about the data and also alumni detection classification, at AI, and how? What is your opinion about the machine learning and artificial intelligence for power systems? Yeah. Well, this should be carefully. This should be carefully touched. Of course, uh, I, I I can talk about my opinion. I I'm okay. still I I still rely a lot on Maxwell Kirchhoff and on the physical laws. However, when we when we look at uh, disturbance detection where, for instance, in high voltage partial discharges or detection of harmonics of all these things, mm -hmm. then you can really use quite uh, successfully machine learning algorithms. However, at this point, I think that the system is still, it is so complicated that we cannot fully rely on data. We have to use also law of physics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thank you. And because and uh, a lot of the participants they ask a question about uh, the IBR, the, the inverter based uh, renewable system. So, from your opinion, what is the most critical challenge for the for the future for or for the next five years? And how do you think the IBR? Uh, yeah. Well, concerning IBR, uh, I have, uh, of course, ideas. So, on uh, developing new protection algorithms, uh, normally. Uh, People from academia think differently than the people from the industry. Industries are very careful. They are conservative. However, I also support this opinion. Uh, normally, there are a lot of algorithms. However, the question is how these algorithms can be made available to work in practice, how you can turn this into hardware. So not everything is possible to be to be put on hardware. And this out of step protection concept, for instance, that works, that has been installed in Iceland, it operates, and this makes use also of existing hardware, which is uh, General Electric. So if you could see that algorithm is not so complicated, and this is how normally it should be realized. So we have now new ideas of how we can improve the fault detection and fault operation. Some things has, have been done so far. However, we are not so far in this topic. There is still work needed and time needed to accomplish this. Yeah, let me final check our chat and the QA. Yeah, as we don't have the, any questions and uh, so I can close the session. 
Thank you very much, and the Professor Maya Popo, and uh, thank you everyone to, to join uh, this session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you also, Dr. Zhang. Thank you for chairing this session, and I also express my thanks to Elsevier for this invitation and for our in-prime join. Thank you a lot, and have a nice day. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye. Bye.